All right, so we're making our way through Unit 3 of Parables of Jesus. And Unit 3 is called Foundational Parables because these parables, most of the parables that we're covering in this unit, are so foundational to the teachings of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all found them significant enough to include in their gospel accounts. Now, we're going through the Mark version of these parables, but as needed and when appropriate, appropriate. I am also digging into the the places where the Matthew version is a little bit different or Luke highlights a little bit something different about what Jesus said in that moment. There's value in all of them, but because Mark was the first gospel written and the others were written after that, we're going through the Mark version of these foundational parables. We're also in this course taking a solid look at the context in which all of these parables are told because it's significant that Jesus is usually answering or responding to a situation in the form of a parable. So we've got to know what's happening and what is the context and the setting in which these parables are being told. And so today we're entering into a new context. Jesus is again in the Galilee area, and he has just finished up feeding 4,000 people with miracle bread and fish. Okay, you know the story. So this is immediately following the 4,000, but the 5,000, he had fed the 5,000 in the same manner before this. So he has now miraculously fed the masses. Now, remember, the scripture says that it was 5,000 men, not including women and children, or 4,000 men, not including women and children. So there were probably tens of thousands of of people there that were fed with just a few loaves and just a few fishes. And Jesus had now done this on two separate occasions. Well, after this amazing, miraculous sign, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, came to Jesus to test him by demanding a miraculous sign. Huh? Like, um, feeding 20,000 people with bread that didn't exist, like, that's not a big enough sign for you? Uh, just saying. Anyway, so they come and they are trying to test him to prove that he's not the Messiah. They're testing him in a negative way to try to get him to stumble or prove himself to be false. And so they're trying to test him by demanding a sign from heaven. Well, Jesus, he refused to give them a sign. He said, no sign will be given you except the sign of Jonah, an evil and adult and wicked generation makes a demand for a sign. Well, shortly after this incident with the Pharisees, Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples and they're traveling along in the boat. And then the disciples realize that they had forgotten to bring any bread. And they were like, "Uh uh-oh, we're going to go hungry. We don't have any bread. Okay, so that's Mark 8, verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. So that's the setting, that's the setup for Jesus then responding to his disciples who are in the boat with him with that singular loaf of bread. And Jesus is now going to start speaking in parables. So this is Mark 8, starting with verse 15. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12, because I love this about Jesus. Jesus doesn't waste a thing. Even though he's able to provide as much miracle bread as anyone could possibly need, he doesn't let it go to waste. Nothing is ever wasted with Jesus. He sent his disciples out to gather up the leftovers so that nothing would be wasted. So Jesus is just reminding them of how many baskets they picked up after he had fed the people. And then he goes on. This is, we're up to verse 20. And the seven for the 4,000 How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? So he leaves it off. And the Matthew version of Jesus saying almost exactly the same thing, he adds on to that, O you of little faith. 
So his own disciples, the ones who have traveled with him, been closest to him, heard his proclamation of the kingdom of God, seen the sick healed, seen demons cast out of people, heard the words of Jesus, the words of life being spoken, you know, like they themselves, even after all of that, do not yet understand that God is in the boat with them. And that God is able to supply all that they need, even if they only have one loaf of bread. And with the example of the 5,000 and the 4,000 leading up to this, you'd think that, I mean, it, bread is bread. If he could multiply it for the masses, do you think he can't make one loaf multiply to feed the 12 of you? I mean, come on, oh, you of little faith. Jesus wasn't being insulting. I think he was a little disappointed. Like, really? You don't you don't see it yet? Because the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out. So they were fleshly and carnal. They were earthly. They had no ability to perceive and understand the things that in the Spirit are more obvious. And Jesus was just having an encounter with the flesh of man that was unable to believe and receive the beauty and the abundance of all that God is able to do to provide for his people. So as we previously covered discussing a different parable, leaven or yeast, Jesus is saying, beware of the leaven, which is yeast of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Um, the Matthew version also speaks about the leaven of the Sadducees, and we'll talk about that in a second. But yeast is a very small thing that you put in flour when you're making bread or dough. And that yeast spreads throughout the whole dough. Even though there's much more flour than there is yeast, the yeast spreads throughout the dough and causes the dough to rise. That's what gives bread its height. That's what causes bread to rise. It's the yeast. It's the leaven inside of it. Well, scientifically speaking, yeast actually corrupts the dough. It causes fermentation and decay in the dough that would not otherwise happen if the yeast were not present. Yeast changes the character of the dough through the process of fermentation, which is what yeast activates in flour or in dough. So interestingly, kind of as a side note, yeast is forbidden on the altar of God. There can be no yeast in the sacrifices presented at the temple on the altar of the Lord, with very few and very specific exceptions. Uh, for example, on the day of Shavuot, which we know as the Feast of Pentecost, then a leavened loaf was allowed to be brought. But it's the exception to the rule. The rule is no yeast and also no honey on the altar of God. You can look at the law for more details on that. And in fact, actually, an entire feast of the Lord is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So for seven days following the Passover, all of Israel does not eat yeast. They have to eliminate all the yeast from their house for exactly seven days and not eat anything that is leavened. So that's a whole other topic. We don't have time to go down that rabbit trail today, but I wanted to mention that so you're getting an idea that Jesus is saying, watch out for yeast. Now, who are the Pharisees? Who are who is Herod? Who are the Sadducees? The Pharisees were religious leaders in the day who they had started off with good intentions. They they started shortly after the return of the exiles from Babylonian captivity. And they understood that they had been sent into captivity and even that their the first temple had been destroyed because of the sin of the people and the idolatry of the people. That the people had had become displeasing to God, and so therefore God had to send them into exile. And now he had returned them to the land, and the Pharisees began shortly after this. Well, they started with the right intention. The word Pharisee is based on the, the Hebrew word, which means to separate. They knew that they needed to be separate from the nations. They needed to separate themselves completely from the practices of the pagans or the Gentiles or the heathens. They needed to be the people of God. 
God. Well, as it continued on through the centuries, they became very religious. They created all kinds of rules about what you could do or what you couldn't do or how it needed to be or what God's Word actually said. They imposed um, strict ritual priestly levels of purity on the common people. So the priests were called to a higher standard of purity than the common people were. That's in the law. But the Pharisees were calling the common people up to the level and the standard of priestly purity, which God never intended for the common people, but only for the priests. Well, the Pharisees, in order to try to prevent another exile or the destruction of the second temple, they forced and required strict adherence to their interpretation of the law of Moses. The Pharisees did have some things going for them, though. They believed in the supernatural, they believed in angels, and they also believed in the resurrection. So good intentions started off well, but somehow became corrupted. The character of it changed somewhere along the way. Hmm, sounds like what happens when yeast gets put in flour to make a dough. Herod was the Roman-appointed and self-named king of the Jews at that time in Judea. So he was a brilliant man who had large and grandiose cities that he built and designed with innovative methods. He was really on the cutting edge of technology in his day. He was a brilliant man, but he was also arrogant, self-willed, self-exalting. And because of all of that, he was also paranoid. He was extremely worldly and self-indulgent, focused on luxury and exalting himself, anything to make himself look better to the destruction of anyone else in his path. And the Herodians, they are also mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament, but they are partisans of Herod. So they are like today, so we can't judge these people from the past because there are the same characters walking around today. They just don't have the same labels on them. But they thought that the wisest thing to do was incorporate God into politics. Yep. Hello. Sounds familiar. So the Herodians were those who were partisans of Herod, his supporters, his campaigners, the ones who were constantly supporting him and exalting him as the leader, right? So the Pharisees and Herod are the ones that are mentioned in the Mark version. The Matthew version also adds the Sadducees. Now, Sadducees are a little bit more similar to the Pharisees in that they are religious leaders of the day. They were, they had the majority of the seats in the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling religious council uh, in the day. And so the Sadducees, they also, nobody really knows exactly when the Sadducees started, but most likely started with the right intentions. Sadducee comes from the Hebrew word for sadiq. Sadiq means a righteous one. So they wanted to distinguish themselves as the righteous ones. They, they had good intentions, but somehow along the way, it became corrupted. Well, they only believed in the first five books of Moses, so they did not put any faith in the historical books or in the prophets. Uh, they did not believe in the supernatural, and they did not believe in the resurrection. And so they also had a far more worldly, earthly, or political motivation, because if you don't believe in the resurrection and the world to come, then this life is all there is. If you think that once you're dead, you're dead, and there is no afterlife, then you're going to be focused as much as you can on prospering and exalting yourself or advancing yourself in this world. So that's where the Sadducees were coming from in comparison or contrast to where the Pharisees were coming from. So they believed that the blessing of God was to be attained in this world through obedience to the law. So they had their own interpretation of the law. They had their own rules and regulations, just like the Pharisees did. So it's kind of like a different denomination, if you will. Today we have denominations. Back then there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were Herodians, etc., etc. So there's nothing new under the sun. It's just that the names change as the generations go by. But that's exactly the problem, because what did Jesus say? He said, watch out. Watch out. Beware. Beware. Because the same yeast that got into them, who started off well but then became corrupted, that same yeast can get into you.
if you're not careful. He said, watch out and beware. And he rebuked the disciples. Wait a second. Do you not yet see? Do you not yet have ears to hear? Do you not yet perceive and understand? And they didn't. He's rebuking them. Oh, you of little faith, you are becoming just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even though you've seen these amazing miracles right before your eyes. So the disciples were starting to behave like religious people who had not been with Jesus and had not seen all the miracles that he had worked. The disciples, they had one loaf of bread and they're like, oh man, we're going to go hungry. They just weren't putting the pieces together. And Jesus said, watch out, you're really missing the point. And what got into the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod that started off well, but then became corrupted, that same thing could get into you if you're not on guard. So what's the point? The point is that God is all sufficient and all powerful. God is able and he has absolutely demonstrated that he is willing to work miracles for his people to supply what they need. Our job is to believe him, to have faith in him, to not be people of little faith, but to believe him and not to make demands of him to test him, even though he has already proven himself. You know, the sign of Jonah has already been fulfilled. Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and resurrected on the third day. He is now seated in bodily form in heaven at the right hand of God. The sign of Jonah has already been given to this wicked and adulterous generation. In addition to the fact that God still continues to this day to work marvelous miracles, including the multiplication of food. I have seen that many times in the nations where God has sent me out to very remote places where they are extremely poor. And God makes sure through miraculous means that people have what they need. God is able to provide. Our job is to believe and not to harden our hearts. But we must be alert and aware that just because our hearts might be sincere, we need to make sure that they're not sincerely wrong in going in the wrong direction by following the path of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herod or the Herodians. We need to keep our sights strictly and purely on Jesus. Pure and simple, childlike faith. That's what he is after. Do you not yet understand? So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is God. Jesus is the bread of God. He talks about that in John chapter 6. And he's using the bread and yeast as an analogy, or that's what the parable is, for rebuking his disciples for not understanding who he is. The yeast is something that has corrupted the minds of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Herod. But he's saying, don't let that get into your mind, into your bread. I am the bread of God, he's saying. And Jesus is unleavened bread. There is nothing corrupt in him. There is nothing sinful in him. There is nothing in him that could not be offered on the altar of God. Hallelujah. And the further considerations, well, you know, just before this, the Pharisees had demanded a sign to test Jesus. And we can also test God through our unbelief and making demands of him to prove himself to us. God does not have to prove himself to us. And when we put demands on him in that manner, we are proving ourselves to be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the other ones who came to test Jesus and try to trap him. And if you want a a psalm to read, read Psalm 78. After this class is over, go and read Psalm 78 for yourself. It talks about how Israel, the people of Israel, in spite of all the many miraculous signs that they had seen, continually put God to the test through their own unbelief. So we want to learn the lesson. 
from that and not be like them. The other element there is that the Luke version of this uh, parable makes it very clear that the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Jesus states it plainly, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, a hypocrite, by definition, if you were a Greek speaker, a hypocrite is an actor. So if we were speaking in Greek, we would say George Clooney is a hypocrite. He is an actor. Now, what does an actor do? They read lines. They assume a character. They pretend to be someone that they are not to put on a show. Well, that's what a religious person is. If they say they believe one thing, they're reciting the lines of someone else's belief, but their own actions prove that they do not actually believe what they say. So with George Clooney, he reads his lines. They finish the scene. They say, cut. He changes his wardrobe back into his regular clothes. He goes home and he behaves like George Clooney. He doesn't behave like the character that he's playing on whatever movie he's recording. He's an actor. That's what actors do. So actors can say all the right things. They can do all the right things when it's on public display. But in the privacy of their own hearts and the actual actions that stem forth from those hearts prove that their hearts do not actually believe all of the things that they're able to say so freely with their mouth or the show that they're able to put on so readily when they go to synagogue or to temple. And friends, if I just described you and the way that you are when you go to church and then the way that you are when you go home, If you go to church and you can sing all the songs, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and then you go home and you still watch porn like you ever did, you're a hypocrite. You're an actor. When you go into church, you're assuming a role, you're saying someone else's lines, and then when church is over, you go home and you behave like yourself. You're an actor. Watch out. Watch out. That is dangerous territory. Now, we're not talking about bread anymore. We're talking about faith in God and his power to change and transform your life into one who is like him and without sin. Hallelujah. Watch out for the yeast, for the leaven of the Pharisees who started off ready to separate themselves from the heathen, from the Gentile, from the pagans and all of their practices, but somehow along the way became corrupted through rules and unbelief and their own religious performance. The Sadducees, who became corrupted by their unbelief in anything but what happens in this world, Herod and the Herodians, who became corrupted by their focus on worldly politics rather than the kingdom of God. Watch out. Beware of the leavens that are trying to corrupt the pure dough that God once offered in your life upon his altar. So wrapping up, there's only one parable in this context, but we're trying to do a big picture review for each context. So in view of all that God has already done for us in giving his son Jesus on the cross, we must be careful that our hearts do not become hard and corrupted through unbelief, through worldliness, or through ignorance, arrogance, ignorance. We have to become like a little child and not be ones who have little faith. Oh, you of little faith, become like a child so that you can enter into the kingdom of God. 